Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the joy of serving you together. Thank you for the revelation of your word. And thank you, Lord, for your love for us individually and as families and as individual workers and leaders in your vineyard. We're asking, Lord, that this love will be definite in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, as the people of old understood your love, understood your grace, and received great things from you. We're asking, Lord, that you prepare our hearts so that we too will receive the great manifestation of experiences of your love in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We will not be tired. Amen. We will not be weary. Amen. And we pray that this word will also always wake us up and will run in the direction of serving you faithfully, effectively in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Better, better. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're looking at verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. You'll see here that the Lord himself mentioned circumcision of heart. From Genesis chapter 17, he has spoken to Abraham and he has spoken to all the children of Israel that will follow after him, after Abraham, concerning circumcision. But at that time, they understood it was to be the circumcision of the flesh. And you understand circumcision, the extra flesh that the boy brings to the world, that extra flesh is uh, taken away. Otherwise, it will be a collecting point for bacteria. Otherwise, it will be a kind of a deposit for dirt. And that's the reason why God said, circumcise the child. But now, he's talking about spiritual circumcision. And he says, the Lord thy God. First of all, is the Lord thy God. Already you are a child of God. Already you have come to God. And and after that experience of being your God, it says the Lord himself will circumcise your heart. And then it says the heart of the seed. That brings in all the women, all the men, everybody that is born into the kingdom of God. And then it says it's to love the Lord your God. Anything that will have hindered, anything that will have covered the love of God, decreased the love of God, the Lord takes away. And after that circumcision, you're able to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind that thou mayest live heart circumcision leads to supreme love towards God and it promises multiplication in every area look at the result I'm reading now from verse 7 after that circumcision of heart look at what will follow and the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee which persecuted thee and that is the consequence of the circumcision when he has taken every hindrance away when he has taken every defilement away and when he has circumcised the heart he says now in verse 8 and I shall return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day it says with that circumcision of heart it becomes easier now obeying God it becomes easier loving God it becomes easier serving the Lord look at verse 9 and the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand and in the and in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy land for good for the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good as they rejoiced over thy fathers it says uh, you understand how I rejoice over Abraham I rejoice over Isaac I rejoice over Jacob you know why because they were circumcised and it says the Lord will circumcise your heart so that he will rejoice over you he rejoice over you like a rejoice over your fathers in verse 10 if thou shalt hearken unto the 
voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments after that circumcision and his statutes which are written in this book of the law and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul look at verse 11 it says for this commandment which I command thee this day it is not hidden from thee neither is it far off it is not in heaven that thou shouldest say who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it it says neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it but the word is near thee it says it circumcises your heart and it calls you to obedience full obedience complete obedience entire obedience perfect obedience and then you cannot say but i don't know the word what am i going to obey i don't know what to do it says it is very near unto thee in thy mouth in thine heart that thou mayest do it you'll do it in jesus name and so we understand this circumcision of heart is equivalent to sanctification sanctification with the possession of christ's mind when he sanctifies us he gives us the mind of christ we're coming to philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 1 in Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 if therefore any consolation in Christ any comfort of love any fellowship of the spirit if any bowels of mercies fulfill my joy that ye be like minded like minded when you are like Christ I'm like Christ and everybody like Christ then will be like minded you see Christ is the standard and Christ Christ is the model by which we measure our love, by which we measure the mind we ought to have. We feel ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. It says that when our love is regulated, is dictated, and it is measured and modeled by the love of Christ, yours is modulated by that, and mine is moderated by that, and his and hers measured by that then we're going to have the same love let nothing be done through strife for vain glory but in loneliness of mind like the lord jesus christ let each esteem other better than themselves look not every man on his own things that is look not every man on his own advantage look at the advantage of other people look not every man on his own happiness on his own joy on his own exaltation but look at the exaltation of the other man the happiness of the other man the joy of the other man the fulfillment the satisfaction of the other man look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others then he tells us in verse 5 let this mind be in you you are already born again you need to possess the mind of Christ you are already regenerated you are, you are redeemed you need to have the mind of Christ and already you are in the kingdom in the kingdom because because your sins are forgiven in the kingdom because you are regenerated and converted now there is something you need you need the very mind of Christ transported into you injected into your life it says let this mind be you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but he made himself of no reputation remember is saying that uh, this is what you need what christ had what christ possess what christ demonstrated that's what you need to have that's what you need to possess and that is what you need to demonstrate and he says he made himself of no reputation that means you're not looking to be exalted above our fellow brethren you're not looking to have reputation above everybody else you're not looking for special dignity or recognition he says he made himself of no reputation this is sanctification and he took upon him the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion 
position as a man he humbled himself remember he's saying that this is what was in christ and this is what should be you be of the same mind as christ of the same character as christ of the same disposition as christ and he when he was uh, found he humbled himself and he's telling us if you are to have the mind of christ if i'm to have the mind of christ i will not humble you you will not humble me but each one will humble himself each one will humble herself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross and then he tells us the advantage of that the profit of that the blessing of that the benefit of that after that sanctification there is a benefit after the sanctification there is a profit after the sanctification there is a result and there is a consequence from the lord wherefore god has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and so you can see when we have sanctification we possess the might of Christ and that results into usefulness because now it makes a men and women bow in submission to Christ through our ministry through our sanctification experience and through our interaction with them the purified heart is uh, with perfect love and that empowers us to have fearless boldness in the pursuit of a uh, divine service we're looking at a uh, first john chapter 4 first john chapter 4 look at what it does when the heart is purified the thing that uh, covered uh, you know our love all that is removed and the thing that slowed us now all that's removed and the thing that may clog the wheel that the wheel cannot uh, flow and move freely and all the friction God takes everything away and that friction that will not allow the wheel to rotate and the wheel to move very well the Lord takes that away by the experience of sanctification and it gives us the mind of Christ and it gives us the love of Christ and it gives us a deeper grace a wider grace a greater grace that will be able to move in the way of the Lord Lord in the things of the Lord without any restriction and without any hindrance I thank God for the Lord who has done it in your life he'll do it more Amen. he'll deepen it in our lives Amen. he'll extend it in our lives and all this love that Christ is looking for as he has sanctified us it will be a replica will be a reproduction of the mind of Christ of the love of Christ of the grace of God in every one of our lives in Jesus name I'm coming to first John chapter 4 first John chapter 4 I'm backing up to verse 13 first John chapter 4 we're looking at verse 13 hereby you know we that we dwell in him and that he is in us because he has given us of his spirit you see the privilege we have as we come to the kingdom of God as members of the body of Christ as soldiers in the army of the Lord he says in that verse 13 we know we're sure of this that we dwell in him and he dwells in us the savior dwells in us the sanctifier dwells in us and the healer dwells in us and the power of heaven dwells in us and he says because he has given us of his spirit of his spirit the interceding spirit he has given us the reproducing spirit he has given us the mighty and the powerful spirit and then he says in verse 14 and we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world and thank god i'm saved i say thank god i'm saved because he sent Jesus Christ to save whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord and the people you are going to the people you are reaching out to he wants to save them and you can say because you saved me and I didn't qualify for that is the grace of God that same grace is available to everyone and I will save all the people we're reaching out to in Jesus name look at verse 15 whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Christ God dwelled in him and he in God look at that privilege as you come to the Lord and you make the habitation clean the habitation pure you make the habitation of your heart you make it holy and righteous by the grace of God and by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb it 
says that whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God and that Son of God is my Savior and that Son of God is my Redeemer and that Son of God is the lover of my soul God dwelleth in him and he in God and we have known and believed the love that God has to us God is love somebody there God is love I said God is love but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever 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 anywhere anytime and everywhere whosoever believeth in him should not perish thank God somebody there you will not perish but have everlasting life he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him look at verse 17 herein is our love made perfect do you know the Lord can perfect your love your love for God God can perfect that your love for your neighbors God can perfect that your love for the brethren God can perfect that he says herein is our love made perfect that we may have what we may have what boldness you know some people after you are born again and then you have the challenge and you have the commission go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature i don't know what you are afraid of you're afraid of their faces you're afraid of their voices you're afraid of their stamina you're afraid of their actions whatever it says that when he circumcises our hearts when he purifies our hearts when he sanctifies us and he gives us this love deep love great love of abiding love it says that this love is made perfect that we may have boldness any time and every time even until the day of judgment because as he is somebody there tell me as he is shout it aloud i said as he is so are we in this world because he gives us his own heart he gives us his own mind he gives us his own power he gives us his own authority and he gives us his own anointing and as he is so are we in this world look at verse 18 there is no fear in love there's no timidity in love there's no cringing in love there's no slavish attitude in love you know if you love somebody you look at the person eyeball to eyeball you're not afraid of the person you love look at a mother that holds the baby in her hand and loves that baby and looks into the eyes of the baby you don't uh, fear the baby you look at somebody that has a father to you know a child and his child has become uh, you know each yet now and you know is uh, having this again that certificate and whatever grammar that person blows daddy is not afraid of that daughter if you have love for somebody you're not afraid of them you love somebody it's an accident you want to recover his life rescue his life and you want to redeem him you're not afraid of him love cancels fear and that's why the lord sanctifies the heart he purifies the heart so that love will cast out every form of fear in Jesus name if you don't want somebody to perish you pity him you sympathize with him you identify with him whoever the person is and whatever the person may be doing because of your love for that person it says in verse 18 there is no fear in love but perfect love casteth out fear perfect love does what everybody one two three go perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment slavish torment you become a slave when you have fear but he says he that feareth is not made perfect in love it is an evidence that we still need to go to calvary and the perfect love of christ will cast out all the fears in our heart in jesus name and so he tells us that when there is sanctification that sanctification will give us fearless boldness in pursuit of divine service this sanctification we're talking about number one purifies the heart this sanctification number two purges the soul number three this sanctification renews the mind the mind we already have the mind and even before we we're born again we had mind and then we're saved and we're forgiven and all the guilt that bothered the heart and the mind all that is taken away but now we're sanctified 
sanctified and sanctification renews the mind sanctification transforms the tongue you know before you were born again the tongue was not under any control now after we're born again then the tongue comes under the control of the spirit and now we are sanctified and because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks if the heart is sanctified then the tongue is transformed sanctification transforms and strengthens the will you know sometimes before you are born again you'll be full of determination and then you say i will do this i will do this i will do that and when the time comes to get the thing done you're weak you're afraid am i going to do that the challenges of the day will not allow you to do what you will to do but you are saved and then you're sanctified and you have the mind of christ and it strengthens the will sanctification corrects the vision you see but there are many people that have eyes but they don't really see well and you cannot tell you cannot tell looking at somebody you cannot tell you might even be coming and then you almost stumble at the person and he says ah, but were you there I didn't know you were there but your eyes look perfect yes they look the eyeballs look perfect but I can see very well when we're sanctified our spiritual sight our spiritual vision is brightened and the vision is corrected sanctification cleanses the conscience the conscience that she you know could do this and do this and not even feel that anything was wrong when we're sanctified the conscience is cleansed sanctification subdues the personality an aggressive personality a boisterous personality a person that will bounce of other people i will not even think of you know how they feel or what it, how it's hurting them sanctification subdues the personality sanctification softens the emotion the emotion you know somebody always gets angry very easily on minor things on negligible things on things that a normal person should overlook he you know he gets bothered and almost either he gets Sangre or he cries or whatever happens but you know sanctification will soften the emotion sanctification refocuses the desire or the pursuit the things were pursuing you're running after this you're running after that when sanctification comes you know what it does it will redirect our natural propensities it redirects our natural propensities sanctification reestablishes the will of god the divine will in our hearts the will of god is what you want now that lord's prayer that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven that's what sanctification accomplishes sanctification uh, redirects our propensities natural propensities and sanctification re-establishes the divine image in us it's a definite experience we're clear and noticeable evidence tonight we're looking at the unlimited potentials of sanctified hearts and purified lives the unlimited potentials of sanctified hearts and purified lives and three things we're looking at number one the experience of circumcision and sanctification of our hearts the experience of circumcision and sanctification of our hearts number two the explicitness when you say something is explicit very clear and very straightforward and very definite the explicitness of consecration and submission in true holiness there's a false holiness there's a hypocritical holiness there's shallow holiness there is a make-believe holiness there is lip service holiness but there's genuine holiness and there is true holiness point number three the exploits of cultivators those who cultivate those who plant and also sow the seed the exploits of a cultivators and seed sowers for the harvest the exploits of cultivators and seed sowers for the harvest tell me your number one tell me number one the experience of circumcision and sanctification of our hearts brothers and sisters is a glorious experience 
I said this is a glorious experience the glorious experience of sanctification you know why we need sanctification actually when Adam and Eve were created there was no foreskin of the heart to be circumcised when Adam and Eve were created there was no depravity to be sanctified or removed when Adam and Eve were created there was no old man that needed to be crucified and there was nobody of sin that needed to be destroyed but after the fall something happened to Adam and something happened unto Eve after the fall something happened to Cain something happened to Abel after the fall there was something that happened to the people that lived before the flood we we'll call them the antediluvian people something happened to them after the flood the people that gathered together something happened to them and it's a multiplication and it's a kind of identification of the mark of the fall of adam and eve the people at babel and as you trace the history of the children of Israel you will see what happened to them and this is the reason why God now says I'll take this up he wants to restore the thing that Adam lost at the fall and he wants to get us back to cross the line of the fall and come back to the original stage and so this sanctification the glorious experience of sanctification you know what it does number one it cleanses us of adamic excuses you see excuses came in the life of uh, adam why have you done this because of the woman woman why have you done this because of the serpent and then a curse came but his sanctification is to remove that adamic nature of excuse making sanctification is to remove case hateful jealousy you see in the heart of a little child it sees the other child having a toy that has a different color and the two colors you know they are the same they are the same good uh, colors but because the color of the other toy is different there's jealousy he throws the one he has away because of Cain's original jealousy in the heart that's what sanctification comes to do to remove Cain's hateful jealousy sanctification comes to remove the antediluvian corruption from the heart it says the way of man became evil in the sight of the lord and every man was corrupt in the sight of the lord and that's why the flood came and god says i don't want to bring another flood anymore and to prevent another flood from coming this is what i'm going to do i'm going to sanctify them i'll take away from their heart the antediluvian corruption you see the people at Babylon those people at Babel gathered together and they said oh, let us build a tower that reaches up to heaven that we may not be scattered all over the face of the earth what's that that's rebellion because God said you multiply and you fill up the whole earth they said no uh, and sanctification comes to remove uh, Babel's rebellious mindset the rebellious mindset that says this is what God says you will do but no we're not going to have that God comes to remove that at sanctification do you remember Pharaoh when Pharaoh was told let my people go that they may serve God on the mountain he said who is that God I don't know who that God is you know what sanctification comes to do sanctification comes to remove uh, pharaoh's hardness of heart from us the heart that will say i don't know god i don't want god i don't want his will in my life sanctification comes to remove that you remember lord of course when abraham said choose whichever area you want if you go to the right i will take the left if you take the left i will take the right and then lord looked at all the places that was good and then he chose that but the bible says and he built his tent near sodom you know what sanctification comes to do sanctification comes to remove lord's greed and selfishness from us 
And then as you think about Reuben, Jacob was about to die now. And Jacob looked at Reuben and he said, Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. And what Sankishan comes to do is that it comes to remove Reuben's unsteady, unstable character from us. He wants to make us straight, wants to straighten our lives. You remember Esau? He came from the field and then he saw the pottage that Jacob had made and he said, I'm hungry, give me pottage. Ah, uh -uh. so we're going to have a deal here. You sell the birthright to me and you can have all the pottage you want. He said, what will the birthright do to me? You see, what was controlling him or his uncontrollable laws and what God wants to do at Sunday is to remove from us Esau's uncontrollable loss. You remember the children of Israel, they wandered in the wilderness. They could have got into the land of Canaan just like that. But they did not. They were wandering and wandering and wandering. And what sanctification comes to do is to remove Israel's wilderness spirit away from every one of us so that our lives will not be aimless. Your life will not be aimless. Your life will not be purposeless. You remember uh, Moses went to the mountain top to go and re receive the law from the hand of God. And before he came back, you remember Aaron? They told Aaron, oh, make us gods that will go before us. For as for this, Moses, we don't know what has happened to him. He compromised and he made an idol for them. And they were dancing, saying, These be the gods that uh, brought you out of Egypt, O Israel. What sanctification? Sanctification comes to remove from us Aaron's compromising nature. You remember Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? When they had this uh, idea that Moses should get out of that place because they said, No, don't make yourself a leader over the people. Are you the holy one, the righteous one? There are many other righteous people. The whole nation is righteous, so get out of the way. Sanctification comes to take away Korah's self exalting disposition from us. You remember Balaam? Balaam silver so panning uh, covetousness. And when he even said, if the way is not right, I will go back after the angel had said, Your way is perverse before me. And sanctification comes to remove Balaam's overpowering covetousness from us. That's why God said, I'm going to sanctify them. I'm going to circumcise them so that all these problems these people had and they were not able to abide with me, they were not able to stay with me. I'm going to remove everything. The experience of circumcision and sanctification of our hearts. I'm coming to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and I'm reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, look at verse 6 again. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Look at that sentence. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart we cannot fully circumcise ourselves. There's nobody that, you know, will um, uh, be so courageous uh, generally that was okay. I'm an adult now. I can bear any pain. I'm going to do circumcision. I take the knife. I'm going to circumcise myself. No, another person will have to do it for you. And God said, this spiritual circumcision and this circumcision of the heart, you cannot treat down to your own heart and remove the Adamic nature and remove all the propensities to evil. I will do it myself. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, and then you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that thou mayest live. Sanctification or circumcision of heart is God's oppression on the heart. He does it himself. Is in sanctification, he removes Adamic original depravity, the original thing that was there, that you were born with, that came me to the world with you, sanctification removes that Adamic original depravity. Sanctification removes the original pride in the heart of Adam. He will not open his mouth to say, I did wrong, I was not right, I abandoned your commandment, I was weak. 
I was influenced and I did evil. No, he will not say that because pride will not allow him to say that. And you see, sanctification comes to remove the original pride away from us. Sanctification comes to remove the original corruption. Original corruption. And that has passed to all the world. Sanctification comes to remove that. There's something we we'll call the blame game the blame game that is a game of blaming other people if uh, you know we're not uh, doing what we need to do it's because it rained if we're not uh, praying uh, it's because you know i've been very busy from the morning i'm so tired if we're not reading the word of god it is because of this if we're not doing the work of god it is because of this we always have something to blame somebody to blame and that we inherited from adam and eve and sanctification comes to remove the original blame game sanctification comes to remove the stubborn heart don't touch that fruit don't eat of that fruit the day you eat of that fruit you will die adam did you hear yes i've heard let your wife know as well we must not touch this we must not eat this and then god went back home to heaven and the serpent came and said come on don't you eat all these fruits oh we can eat everything except this one why not because if we touch it if we eat it we die who said so god said so ah it's not right you cannot die you will not die trust me eat it and she forgot that god was the creator god the master god the king of earth and heaven and that stubborn will then went out and ate not only that gave to her husband and he also did eat sanctification removes the original unwillingness to retrace our steps we want to save our faces i've done it i've done it i know it's wrong I know it's not right, but I'm going to stand by my action. I'm not going to chicken out. I'm not going to uh, let them know that I'm weak. Unwillingness to retrace our steps is Adam's nature. And sanctification comes to remove the original unwillingness to retrace ourselves. The original self-centeredness. Only thinking about myself, my eyes will be opened. I'll be as wise as God. I will know what God knows. That original self-centeredness, God comes to remove the original negligence. When I neglect, look at this, what I mean by the original negligence. I'm coming to uh, Genesis chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image at our likeness in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion look at what they add opportunity responsibility assignment dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air over the cattle over all the earth to have dominion over all the earth what an exalted privilege for them and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful be fruitful you know at the time of the fall they had not even been fruitful they had not had a child before the fall and multiply they had not multiplied before the fall they had not had dominion over all the earth before the fall the same the great privilege the great assignment god had given them they had not even touched that assignment negligent and then just what to eat to touch that fruit and then to eat that was a big thing for them and for many people today 
the assignment of life, the duty of life, and the possibilities they can have in the world. They have not even touched that. And then to climb up the mountains and to walk all the distance, they have not had that dominion they ought to have over themselves and over evil spirits, over every evil power. The dominion he has given, they don't even, they have not even touched that. All they want is something for their belly because of this original negligence and then it says in that verse 28 and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and subdue it there are minerals in the earth adam subdue it and there are metals there subdue that thing and conquer everything i've given all that to your hand they've not even touched anything like that and then it says and i've dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air over every living thing that moveth upon the earth and now uh, look at uh, chapter 3 verse 6 chapter 3 verse 6 here is a big thing for them negligence original negligence it says in chapter 3 verse 6 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and she did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat a great negligence but you know that's the nature of man we're coming to um, we're coming to philippians chapter 3 philippians chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 8 Philippians chapter 3 and we're reading here from verse 18 in verse 18 it says verse 18 it says for many walk of whom I have told you often and now even tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross why whose end is destruction whose God is there tell me their belly Great things they can do, they neglect that. And great mountains we ought to climb, they avoid that. And the great dominion we ought to have, they don't even touch that. And the great work we're to do, they overlook that. And some non essential thing to touch an apple or to touch a particular fruit and eat that, that becomes the greatest thing in their lives. And that original negligence that abandons the important, that abandons the essential, and then we make your mind on non essential things. Like what God also remove when he says i will sanctify you i will cleanse you i will circumcise your heart it says in that verse 19 whose end is their destruction whose god is their belly whose glory is in their shame who mind as things look at the words of jesus in matthew chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 4 matthew chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 4 it says in verse 4 and he answered and said well before i read the verse you know what happened here uh, satan came to the lord jesus christ he wanted to divert his attention his attention from the cross his attention from the glory that will follow his attention from the salvation of the world his attention from the will of the heavenly father his attention from the crown uh, that will come upon him as king of kings and lord of lords his attention from pleasing the heavenly father and what did he want him to do just to take bread just to take bread just a meal just a meal and you see that was a thing that happened to adam and eve they neglected the great assignment the lord had given them to subdue the earth and to be the king and the conqueror of the whole earth and just to touch a fruit and just to eat the fruit and they lost everything but look at this but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He wants us to be circumcised today so that all these uh, concentrations of Adam and Eve will not be in our lives. We're going to have the victory. I said we're going to have the victory. You'll have the victory in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 2 verse 28. He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is uh, outward in the flesh. 
but look at this he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but is of God. I pray that that circumcision, the Lord will accomplish it for everybody in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number two now, the explicitness of consecration and submission in true holiness. As we think about uh, this uh, sanctification, it comes along with consecration. Sanctifying grace grants us deep hunger and deep desire to be better to be holier to be nearer to god the experience of sanctification draws us further to consecration and submission and absolute surrender unto god Con the consecrated and the sanctified believers in bible days explicitly spell out consecration as you look at the men and the women in Bible days, Old Testament, New Testament, and we say that there is sanctification, you can tell, you can tell. As you think about people like Enoch, you can tell that sanctification right there. You think about Moses, that sanctification right there. And you think about Esther in the Bible, that sanctification right there. You think about David to be purer, whiter than snow, that sanctification right there. And a lot of people, you come to Peter, you come to Paul, and you come to many of those people in the New Testament, you come to real experience of sanctification. But I'm going to select some of them that make up the word consecration. Somebody help me shout consecration. C, that's Caleb. O, that's Obed Edom. N, that's Nathan. S, New Testament, that's Stephen. E, New Testament, that's Elizabeth. C, New Testament, that's Cornelius. R, come back to the Old Testament, that's Ruth. A, that's Apollos. T, that's Timothy. I, that's Isaiah. And uh, O, that's Obadiah and Nathaniel. As you look at the lives of these people, and you're looking for explicit understanding of consecration, of submission, and absolute surrender to God, all you need to do is say, Lord, give me similar experience. The kind of experience those people had, and they come together to make consecration unto the Lord. Give me that. Let's look at that very quickly. We're going to run through this. Uh, Caleb, we're looking at uh, Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Uh, we're looking at Caleb from verse 6. In Numbers chapter 14, uh, reading from verse 6, and Joshua is son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and which were of them that searched the land right their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land, and if the Lord delighteth in us, then he will bring us into this land and will give it us. And the land is a land flowing with milk, and only, only rebel not against the Lord. You see what Caleb was doing? Caleb separated himself from all the other spies that went. The people that said, No, we cannot, no, we cannot. Look at what God said about him in verse 24 but my servant Caleb because he had another spirit with him there's somebody in the minority there's somebody who singles out himself a sanctified person is a consecrated person he knows the direction everybody else is going he says no I will not go that direction he's going to have another spirit with him and has followed me fully he's fully following the Lord knowing the will of God and however difficult however high the mountain may be and however reserved or rebellious the other people may be he says I'm not afraid to stand in Alone, I will fully follow the Lord. He says, Him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Oh, is obeyed Edom. We're coming to Second Samuel, 
chapter 6 in 2 Samuel chapter 6 I'm reading here from verse 6 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 6 and when they came to Nikon's threshing floor Uzzah put forth his sand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error for his fault for his transgression for his sin and there he died by the ark of the Lord and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said how shall the ark of the Lord come to me and so David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David but David carried it aside into the house of Obed Edom the Gittite you know the story here is that uh, as they were carrying the ark they didn't follow the proper directives of the Lord and Uzzah died because of that even David became afraid and said ark of the Lord no cannot even come to my city not to talk of coming to my community not to talk of coming to my house he was afraid but one man said for the glory of God for the protection of the ark and for the preservation of the majesty of God in the land you can bring it to my house what if uh, something happens to you I still defend the glory of God with my life that's the consecration we're talking about that he was not afraid of what had happened to Uzzah and he had that ark in his house look at verse 11 and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household you see that's what the Lord will do and I will come to N what's the end there Nathan we're coming to second Samuel chapter 12 second Samuel chapter 12 you know the story I'm just going to read a few verses in verse 7 and Nathan said to David thou art the man you see that sanctification when you know David was his friend and David was a king and David was a very close person but David had not something wrong and the Lord said to Nathan said go and tell your friend go and tell the king uh, that you are his seer you are his prophet and you are his uh, confidant go and tell him I'm angry with him you see that takes consecration for you to know that although he is close to me although I'm close to him this is the word of the Lord unto this man and he came and he told him and he said thou art the man and eventually he told him what will happen and let's uh, come to verse 12 for thou did see it secretly but I will do this sin before all Israel and before the son look at verse 13 and David said unto Nathan I have sinned against the Lord he brought that confession out of him he brought the conviction that this is a great sin he brought it out of him and Nathan said unto him the Lord also has put away the, thy sin thou shalt not die verse 14 how be it how be it because of by this deed thou hast given occasion great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall tell me surely die and then David fasted for seven days and Nathan will not join him in that fasting Nathan will not pray along with him in that fasting he was consecrated to God God falls above my friend God falls above somebody that I even respect as is for Stephen as is for Stephen we're coming to the New Testament Acts of the Apostles chapter 6 in Acts of the Apostles chapter 6 we're reading here from verse 3 Acts chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 3 wherefore brethren look ye out among yourselves seven men number one of honest report no shady deal no fraudulence no cheating 
nothing no skeleton in the cupboard nothing that as we want to choose him now we now hear some stories we never heard before they must be of honest report full of the holy ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business look at verse 5 and the saying pleased the whole multitude and is chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost and then chose others look at verse 8 and Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people look at verse 15 and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel that man was consecrated to god and see how he faced the whole nation no apostle standing by side and no helper standing by side and no supporter standing by side all alone he faced all these people and then he says in chapter 7 verse 51 you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so do ye which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it and when they had these things they were caught to the heart and they gnashed their teeth on him and then it says in verse 55 and he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and he said behold I see the heavens open he knew they were not want to hear they were circumcised in heart he knew they were opposed to that but he will say it anyhow he will say what the lord wanted him to say behold i see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of god consecrated people caleb consecrated people obedidom consecrated people nathan consecrated people stephen consecrated believers elizabeth we're looking at luke chapter one elizabeth a woman a Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, even though they didn't have any child, but look at what the Bible says concerning them. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the cause of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was, tell me please. Elizabeth and they both husband and wife and they both that's Elizabeth the wife too both were righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord was the final word there blameless although there was no child it's okay since we don't have any child it's even a shame for us to say we're serving God are we going to be serving God since there's no child they served God despite the challenge they had you will serve God and the Lord answered their prayer eventually and the Lord has answered your prayer look at verse 74 that he would grant unto us like he granted unto them that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear you'll serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives and then we come to see which is Cornelius you know what Cornelius did look at this in uh, chapter 10 uh, acts of the apostles chapter 10 we're looking at cornelius his consecration his submission and his absolute surrender unto the lord in um, acts chapter 10 uh, reading from verse 1 it tells us there was a certain man uh, in Caesarea called cornelius and a centurion of the band called the italian band you know the story the angel appeared to him I told him to send uh, for Peter who oh, will tell him words that you are here that will bring him to salvation and bring him to the power of God he didn't waste time immediately instantaneously he sent look at verse 24 and uh, the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends he was 
wasn't ashamed that where well, he's uh, calling somebody a Jew uh, coming from Joppa and he's going to tell us the words we need to hear look at verse 33 immediately therefore I Cornelius saying to thee and thou was well done that thou art come now therefore are we all here present before God to hear how many things all things that are commanded thee of God he wasn't afraid of any doctrine he said everything the Lord has commanded we want to hear we are here so that the word of God will transform our lives look at the comment of Peter the apostle uh, for that uh, as to that experience we're looking at uh, Acts chapter 15 verses 8 and 9 and God which knoweth the heart bear them witness giving them the Holy Ghost as he did unto us look at this and they put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith R is for Ruth you understand Ruth had lost her husband at such a, an early age and uh, there were two of them uh, that got married to the sons of uh, Naomi and uh, now Naomi was uh, going back home and uh, the Israelites might not even accept uh, this uh, woman Ruth but look at what we are talking about in consecration Ruth chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 15 Ruth chapter 1 reading from verse 15 it says and she said behold the sister-in-law is come back I don't know anybody except your sister-in-law and I'm an old woman you might not be able to fellowship with me alone is come back to our people and to her gods return thou after thy sister-in-law and Ruth said entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee for whither thou goest I will go he didn't know the place he had never been to the place before it's going to be a strange land but he said i trust the lord and i trust you and i'm going to follow him whether thou goest i will go and whether thou lodgest, i will lodge i don't know what kind of house you are going to lodge a touched building a bad a dilapidated building a mosquito invested place wherever it is wherever you go wherever you lodge i will lodge that people shall be my people i may not understand their attitude their disposition their language or difficulty challenges before me they will be my people and thy God my God I don't understand why my husband died but all the same your God will be my God your own husband also died I don't understand I don't understand the mysteries of the kingdom the mysteries of God even though I don't understand I trust in that God he cannot do evil he allowed that for a purpose and I submit to that purpose of God and he says your God will be be my God where thou diest there I will die and there will I be buried the Lord do so to me and more also if aught but dead but thee and me when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her then she was speaking unto her that's consecration that a person will say I don't know the future I don't know tomorrow I don't know the people I'm going to meet I don't know the challenges I'm going to face but all all the same I'm going to serve God I will serve God I said I will serve God and then when we're not looking back and we're saying that whatever comes and whatever goes whatever happens whatever does not happen husband is coming wife is coming or maybe they are coming late whatever it is I will serve God that's the consecration they demonstrated from Caleb to Obed Edom to Nathan to Stephen and to Elizabeth to Cornelius and to Ruth and we're going to demonstrate that same submission to God in Jesus name and that's so absolute or reserved irreversible surrender to the Lord in Jesus name we're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 18 the next letter is A which is Apollos and you can see these people that we're talking about if the grace of God was given to them that same grace will be given to us Acts of the Apostles chapter 18 I'm reading from verse 24 Acts chapter 18 reading from verse 24 and it's 
certain Jew uh, named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. You know, the pride that could come in a man's heart was mighty in the scriptures, and then he had known a John the Baptist very well had been instructed directly by John the Baptist and when he delivered the message he was an eloquent man and everybody could see that but look at this and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him unto them they said come on here that's what you are saying, huh? but it's not the whole truth. You know, it's not perfected yet. And they expounded unto him privately the way of the Lord more perfectly. The submission and the willingness to learn and the teachable spirit, that's the consecration. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples uh, to receive him when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Of course, you remember Timothy in Philippians chapter 2 a man that distinguished himself that Paul the apostle commended and he said I have no man like him sanctified man submissive man absolutely surrendered man a consecrated man we're looking at Timothy now in Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 19 but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly on to you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state for I have no man like minded his, um, his uh, consecration is indisputable his conviction is indisputable his absolute surrender is uh, there's no doubt about that and his yieldedness and willingness to run when you tell him to run there's no doubt about that it says uh, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state for all men seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ but you know the proof of this man of him of Timothy that as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel uh, that's that's the example uh, that the Lord is showing us concerning people in Bible days who are sanctified who are committed who are consecrated who are absolutely yielded and surrendered unto him i pray that that same grace the lord will give to every one of us Amen. and your life will spell out consecration Amen. your commitment will spell out consecration Amen. and heaven will be a witness to that consecration submission surrender absolute surrender as well as your sanctification in jesus name i say we're looking at isaiah chapter 6 i see a chapter 6 and then i'm reading from verse i'm reading from verse 5 then said i woe is me for i am undone because i'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims unto me I mean, a life call in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from up the altar and laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Of course, he was a prophet before this time. He had been saved, he had been a child of God, he could refer to the Lord as his God. In fact, he had been running errands even for the Lord, but at this time now, now he said the original sin the depravity the internal corruption everything is purged and taken away and after that he had the voice of the lord and i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i sin and who will go for us then said i everybody one two three go 
here am I send me the Lord will send us in Jesus name and now O is for Obadiah we're coming to first Kings chapter 18 first Kings chapter 18 and we're looking at the influence of Obadiah the place where Obadiah was working and yet the conviction of Obadiah even though he was working in the palace of Ahab we're coming to this first Kings chapter 18 and I'm reading from verse 3 first Kings chapter 18 reading from verse 3 and Ahab called Obadiah which was governor of his house Obadiah governor of his house you will think that anybody working as a governor of the house of Ahab will never be religious and will not even come near righteousness at all and will not know the true religion at all and then it says now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly and it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took how many people and hundred prophets and hitched them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water one hundred prophets out of his own expenses he hid them somewhere in a cave so that they will not die he protected them with his own life and they will feed them with bread and water every day and Ahab said unto Obadiah go into the land unto the fountains of waters unto all the brooks for adventure we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive and that we lose not all the bees so they divided the land between them to pass through out it and Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself and as Obadiah was in the way behold Elijah met him and he knew him and fell on his face and said at thou that my lord Elijah please understand when somebody is walking under a master and that master counts uh, that Elijah an enemy and never spoke well about Elijah if the person was not a person of conviction he'll have the same attitude as Ahab he'll belittle he'll despise uh, Elijah but not Obadiah this is the consecration we're talking about that you're in Rome but you're not doing as the Romans do you're in Babylon you're not doing as the Babylonians do and you are with Ahab in the palace but you don't have the mind and the heart and the hatred of uh, this uh, Ahab he said art thou Elijah my Lord it says and he answered I am go tell thy Lord behold Elijah is here and he said what have I seen that thou wouldest deliver thy servant thy servant thy servant he called himself the servant of Elijah and he said you want to deliver me to the hand of Ahab to slay me and as the Lord thy God liveth there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord Ahab has not sent to seek thee and when they said he is not there he took an oath of the kingdom and the nation and that they found thee not and now thou seest go tell thy Lord uh, behold Elijah is here and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not he believed in the Holy Ghost he believed in the power of the spirit of God he believed in the possible rapture that God can use the spirit of God to take Elijah away even though he was walking in Ahab's house and then he says and so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find thee he shall slay me he knew the danger of serving in that place but all the same God was number one and the prophets the protection of the prophets was number one but I the servant fear the Lord from my youth well the story goes on and you know how Elijah eventually met Ahab and how he brought all the people together and he said if God be God serve him if Baal serve him and eventually all the contest you know about look at the final scene here in verse 30 
7 hear me O Lord hear me that these people may know that thou art God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again it was uh, the helping hand of Obadiah that made this to happen eventually and now the whole nation turned back to God God will use you in this nation I said God will use you in this nation but you have to distinguish yourself you have to separate yourself from the edict and hurry in the land and it says in verse 38 then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the doors and leached up the water that was in the trench and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is God the Lord he is God uh, and the last end is Nathaniel we're looking at uh, John chapter 1 John chapter 1 I read from verse 47 in John chapter 1 verse 47 and Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and says unto him behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no girl oh you say but he has not met Jesus before how could he be an Israelite indeed you forget that the Old Testament people too there are some Israelites indeed like Enoch like Abraham and like Moses and in the people there was no girl there are people like Samuel people like Daniel there are people like Jeremiah people like Ezekiel behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no girl and Nathanael says unto him whence knowest thou me Jesus answered and said unto him before that Philip called thee when thou was under the fig tree I saw thee and Nathanael answered Said and said unto him rabbi thou art the son of god thou art the king of israel and jesus answered and said unto him because i said unto thee I saw thee because I said unto thee I saw thee under the fig tree believest thou thou shalt see greater things than these you'll see greater things yes. sanctification brings us into the experience that prepares us to see greater things and mightier things it says in verse 51 and it says unto him verily verily I say unto you hereafter ye shall see heaven opened and the angels of God descending and ascending ascending and descending upon the Son of Man amen, amen. it will happen in Jesus name amen. the same grace for consecration that was available to them the same grace for sanctification available to all these men and the same selflessness the same consistency and the same submission we've seen explicitly manifested in their lives all that is available for you today available for me today available for all of us today and we're going to experience that in jesus name now you've seen all these people and you see how serviceable how useful how profitable they were in the kingdom of god and now it's our turn as we bring together all their attributes all their character and we bring together all the grace of god in their lives and they're replicated they are reproduced in our lives as they were useful to the lord we are going to be useful to the Lord we shall do exploits somebody there said you will do exploits you forget the pastor say today I'm beginning a new journey and a new race and a new assignment and we're going to succeed in Jesus name point number three now the exploits of cultivators and seed sowers for the harvest the exploits exploits will come fruit producers and we produce fruit for the kingdom of God and we do exploits in the kingdom of God how are we called cultivators because we we'll say we're talking about the cultivators and the seed sowers look at what this means we're looking at Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 10 Jeremiah chapter 1 we're looking at it from verse 10 because here the cultivators how we cultivate how we plow and how we uh, develop and take all the weeds out of the farm and then we're able to produce you'll be a producer Am I talking to somebody there? 
you'll be a producer in Jesus' name. Look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter, chapter 1, verse 10. See, I have this thee, this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Number one, to root out. Number two, to pull down. Number three, to destroy. Number four, to throw down. Number five, to build. Number six, to plant. We are cultivators in the kingdom of God. And it says we are called to root out. What does that mean? We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 3. It says, Thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among sons. You're sowing the seed of eternal value, the seed of the word of God, the seed that will produce conviction and produce conversion and produce salvation in the hearts of the people. You're first of all weed out, you're cut off, and you will root out all the all the sons in the hearts of those people look at chapter 15 of matthew matthew chapter 15 reading from verse 13 matthew chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 13 it says in verse 13 he answered and said every plant which my heavenly father has not planted tell me shall be rooted up that's our responsibility you look at the community and you look at the idolatry there that the lord has not planted you look at the tradition there that the lord has not planted and you look at all the plants of evil that the lord has not planted you're not just okay i'm preaching the gospel and throw the seed anyhow anywhere you root up all those things that the heavenly father has not planted in that community and then you will sow the seed your seed will bear fruit Number two, it says we pull down. We pull down in second, uh, second Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians chapter ten. I'm reading from verses four and five. Second Corinthians chapter ten. We're reading from verses four and five. It says in verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare, the word of God says, are not carnal. We're not going to use uh, carnal methods and human methods and, and fleshly methods, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. As you go about, you are planting the seed of the word of God. There are some strongholds in the place that will not allow the people to receive the word, to accept the word, or to be saved. All those strongholds you are going to pull down in Jesus' name, casting down imagination imaginations and every high sin that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing in into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ the Lord will use you and then it says to destroy to destroy you see when Paul the apostle went to the Corinthians there were some ideologies among them philosophies among them he destroyed them first and then he planted the word of the gospel that's why he said later in Galatians chapter 2 Galatians chapter 2 reading here from verse 18 Galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 18 for if I build again the things which I once destroyed I make myself a transgressor all the Judaism he destroyed them all the tradition he destroyed them all the idolatry he destroyed them everything as they went from location to location and it went from community to community and anything that is not of the gospel of the true gospel it destroyed them and then some people are now saying they be gentle be gentle and they do nicely and accept all these things let those people have what they want to have let them say one well, you preach your own gospel and let all those things be said no because if i build again the things i once destroyed i make myself a transgressor all those things the lord has destroyed we're not going to build them up again it tells us in first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 8 and he that committed sin is of the devil thank god i'm not of the devil my brother my sister there i said thank god i am not of the devil you will not be of the devil in jesus name 
and he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of God was manifested tell me that he might destroy the works of the devil Jeremiah you know what you have to do you have to root out you have to pull down you have to destroy everything that Christ would have destroyed if Christ came to this community if Christ came to your local government if he came to your region if was preaching the gospel in your vicinity everything he would have destroyed that's what you are to destroy today and then we're to throw down you throw them down anything militating against the gospel you'll throw them down in jesus name and you're going to be strong your backbone is going to be strong conviction is going to be strong malachi chapter one malachi chapter one i'm reading here from verse four malachi chapter one verse four whereas edom says we're impoverished but we will return and build the desolate places thus says the lord of hosts they shall build but i will throw down i will throw down all the things they built to the honor of satan you will throw down everything they built to the honor of the flesh you will throw down and they shall call them the border of wickedness the people against you the lord has indignation forever now we are going to sow now you are going to sow but first of all you sow yourself you sow your seed you sow your own life you sow your own gift and you plunge everything you have into the kingdom work and you are going to do exploits in the name of the lord uh, look at look at uh, john chapter 12 and reading from verse 24 john chapter 12 reading from verse 24 verily verily i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone you will not abide alone you will not be fruitless you will not be purposeless you will not just be coming and be a worker and be a worker and yet you are not bearing fruit you are going to be fruitful but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit bringeth forth much fruit somebody there is going to begin to bring forth much fruit in uh, ecclesiastes chapter 11 ecclesiastes chapter 11 i'm reading from verse 4 ecclesiastes 11 and we're reading from verse 4 it says in verse 4 he that observes the wind shall not sow if you're going to be a seed sower you're not say well it's a cloudy it's going to rain and look at the wind blowing he that observeth the wind shall not sow and he that regarded the cloud shall not trip look at verse 6 in the morning sow thy seed in the morning sow thy seed in the evening will hold not thine hand for thou knowest not whither shall prosper either this or that or whether both shall be like good the time has now come Amen. your time has now come Amen. you will do exploits Amen. i'll watch you succeed Amen. i'll watch you bear fruit Amen. i'll watch you with your testimonies Amen. am i talking about somebody there I said, am I talking about somebody there? Look at this final verse I'm reading. Because this one is for you. Amen. Say, this is mine. Daniel chapter 11 Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Those are the people that one is not for you. Amen. But the people that do know their God. Are they here tonight? the people that do know their god i said that they there tonight they shall be strong they shall be strong you will be strong in conviction you'll be strong in your heart you are going to be strong and they shall do exploits and do exploits there's no sanctification without self-forgetfulness 
Sanctification means you forget yourself. You abandon yourself now into the work of God. No sanctification without sacrifice. You are ready now. Christ has sacrificed everything and you are ready to sacrifice whatever it will take. You will sow the seed. There's no sanctification without submission. Your submission to the calling of God, to the will of God, to the mind of God. There's no sanctification without separation unto God. You are totally separated unto God. There's no sanctification without seeking to please God supremely in all things, in every way and every day. There's no sanctification without absolute surrender. There's no sanctification without sacrificial service. There is no sanctification without seed sowing for his harvest. It is only when we sow the seed and you give yourself unreservedly that you are going to be a fruit. And I see you bearing fruit. I see you succeeding. I see you uh, doing exploits for the glory of God. Our exploits are revealed as we turn many to the Lord and turn many to righteousness. I am bearing fruit. I will not be alone. I am bearing fruit. I said I am bearing fruit. You will bear fruit with me. You bear fruit like me. And everywhere you go, you open your mouth to declare the word of God. The sick will be saved through you. Sinners will be converted through you. Believers will be sanctified through you. Where are the fruit bearers? Where are the sowers of the seed? And where are the cultivators here tonight? Open your mouth and tell the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, make use of me. Here am I, here am I, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Let him use you, let him use you. You've heard of Caleb, let him use you. You've heard of Obedidum, let him use you. You've heard about Nathan, let him use you. Haven't you heard about Stephen, about Elizabeth, about Cornelius, about Ruth, about Apollos, about Timothy, about Isaac, about Abba? about Nathaniel they are gone but you are there the Lord wants to lay his hand upon you he wants to use you mightily tell the Lord I am available here are my Lord send me